Hi, everybody, and hello to you, Matthew. Hello, Carolyn. I'm, I'm delighted. You. It's so wonderful to have you back for another seminar. Um, everyone loved the first one, and this one's going to be just as delicious. And so what we're doing today is an intro video for all of you so we can share our enthusiasm about this upcoming class, The Fire Within, because I think it's absolutely delicious and I'm going to start with asking you a question. What a change for me to drill my professor, but <laughs> on what inspired the class, The Fire Within? Well, I think the times we're living in, you know, we're living in rough times, tough times, challenging times, perilous times, but oh, such important times. You know, it's, it's a great gift to be living in these times because we all have a a role to play in moving our species ahead, uh, in moving it to its next uh, state of awareness and consciousness that uh, we're not gonna solve our problems by um, yesteryear's consciousness. We have to move to a new level of maturity as human beings. And the mystics are tremendous um, gifters in this regard. Carl Jung said that we, um, we, to the mystics, we owe what is best in humanity. So given the direness of the climate change and disappearance of species today, and of course of humanity's capacity for war and the rest that we see in Ukraine and, and everywhere, um, of course we want to turn to what is best. And John the Cross is one of these amazing guides, I think, for our time. He himself lived through tremendous political upheaval. It was during the time of the Reformation and of the um, Spanish colonizing of the New World. And um, he lived through it all. But And he himself became an activist right off the bat because his mentor, Teresa of Avila, uh, dragged him into it. Yeah. She was older than him and um, she was already fighting tough battles and she saw in him a warrior mm -hmm. and she enlisted him in a deeper contemplative experience and a deeper experience of taking on the powers that that um, were running things at that time. And so what happened to him early was he was condemned by his uh, brother Carmelites who were resisting reform in the church and reform in the order. And they literally locked him up and tortured him for nine months and practically killed him. Then he had this daring escape and then he wrote this amazing poetry about the dark night because he had lived through it uh, as, a, as a, a victim in prison. And, uh, and he speaks to us through his poetry. I think um, every generation derives a great uh, enthusiasm and aspiration and sense of calmness and um, beauty in being exposed to his poetry. So we want to explore that poetry and how it speaks to us today in the 21st century. And I think like all the great mystics, he speaks to our hearts as well as our heads and to our sense of courage and, and um, sacred activism because that, that wrapped his entire life story. Well, you know, I want to comment on a couple of things and one is how much I agree with you in that I think it's a privilege to be alive now. I think it's a privilege. And I think <clears throat> if I had one wish, it would be that I could go forward a hundred years and see what historians write about this time, mm -hmm. and how we navigated this time and who we turn to as mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the spokespeople, how we navigated a time when in fact, with clear sight, it, it's obvious to me that our collective, our society is in a spiritual crisis and it is collectively going through a dark night. And, this, and, the, and there's so much about the work of the mystics that draws me and always has ever since I, I was, uh, before I was a student of yours, but what has always compelled me about mystics from any tradition, whether it's Catholic or uh, Episcopal or Buddhist or Hindu or, or Islam, 
um, Islamic is that they have a way of seeing the whole, of recognizing the despair people experience, and oftentimes have had to experience that themselves, like John of the Cross, and yet they make it through stronger. They're not defeated by living in the present moment. And I loved, and it was the only time I've ever seen it, you know, John of the Cross's poetry referred to as prison poetry and the, as you wrote about it. And that stood out for me because I think that it's not um, an exaggeration to say that the way people feel when they are in times of chaos is that they are imprisoned by the chaos, mm. is that they are imprisoned by it. And they don't know what to choose and they don't know how to go through it. And what happens is the same kind of choice I think that John of the Cross or other profound, profound philosophers or thinkers or generals or whomever, they make the decision as to whether the chaos will dictate their future or whether that chaos becomes something they transcend. Wonderfully put. I really like that. And I'm glad you you like that um, dimension of prison poetry, because I think that helps to explain John's work. And if we take it out of that context, his personal context and the political context, which put him in jail in the first place, mm -hmm. then um, we, we can easily sentimentalize or spiritualize what he's doing. And I think, frankly, that a lot of interpretation of John the Cross has been that way, that many interpreters over the years, theologians in particular, have um, narrowed it down to some psychological analysis of um, um, mortifying the senses or something like that. But, you know, that gets done for you when you're in prison, especially when you're in a prison where your brothers are literally beating you on a regular basis and starving you. And, of course, in the heat of of Spain's summer and all the rest. So that's so important that we realize there is a category for this literature that John bequeathed to us. And I think it is prison poetry. And that very word kind of um, alerts us to what a, an activist he really was. He paid a price. Uh -huh. And I mean, and you know, we look at, we honor great people. Gandhi was in prison. More counts in and, and for 20 some years and of course Martin Luther King Jr and and Paul St Paul was in prison and wrote letters from there like King did from Birmingham jail so um what we write in prison you know it gets you down to what Howard Thurman called the um we need to be stripped to the literal substance of ourselves before God that's what the dark night does for us uh -huh. it takes us down to our inner innards, <laughs> yes. spiritually, just like you said, are we going to yield to the defeat and to the the everyday values of a, of a system, or are we going to resist and deeply? And to do that, you have to dig deeply into yourself, into mm. your heart, into your values, into what you cherish. And all that comes up, I think, in, in John's poetry. Yes. And I think, and I think if I may, uh, I don't know how you, I'd love your feedback on this, but I also think that part of what is being in prison is, for example, I'm sure everybody was moved by the murder of Tyron Nichols by five police officers. And it brings up again the prison of racism. That too is a prison of sorts. It may not be a literal prison, but it is a prison. And breaking out of that prison, enduring it, is also where I think this the guidance of, of great mystics come in. Um, because the psychological, racist, or social uh, mindsets in a society are themselves psychic prisons. Absolutely. We carry our prisons around with us. Yes. And when we talk about prison of racism, that applies to those who are projecting it 
and um, and hiding behind structures that are themselves racist, okay. and and in other words, who are imposing racism on others. But it also applies, of course, to the the victims, if you will, or to the recipients Precise. of this of this hatred. Precise. So it's present on both sides. The same could be said of the um, tremendous gap between the the billionaire class who run Wall Street and the Main Street class. In a way, they're both imprisoned. Main Street is imprisoned by the decisions made in favor of Wall Street and the politicians who are emboldened to Wall Street. Um, and But they're in a system that's created like that. So they're in a prison. But then too, the billionaires are in a prison of their own because their view of the world is so from the top of a skyscraper down instead of in a circle where we're eye to eye and we're human to human. And you know, the prison, another prison we're in today, of course, is anthropocentrism. I mean, this is a cause of climate change that for centuries, modern consciousness and modern world has been thinking only of the human. What Pope Francis called the narcissism of our species. We've been extracting from the earth like it was infinite or something that, that it couldn't stop. And now we, we've, we're paying the bill. It, there's a reckoning going on. So there is a prison on both sides there too. And the news that have come out about indigenous people in these awful schools. Right, right. Put up by both government and religion. There is an imprisonment for sure of the children and their parent, their society, their culture that lost the children on the one hand. But then the mindset, how is it possible that people who tell us they believe in Christ or religion or something go around, you know, destroying children, literally trying to wipe out their culture, their language, their religion, even cut their hair and their change their names in the name of what? You know, so there's imprisonment on both sides. And, and uh, we all want to escape these prisons. And, but I, and there you have the operative word, which is the escape, which means which brings up the fear of freedom that people hold toward other groups of people. Yeah. It's the fear of their freedom that keeps people making decisions that imprison others. Mm. It's the fear. If you have freedom, you'll make legislation that will imprison me. If I help you elevate yourself socially, educationally, financially, then you'll imprison me. So this business of prison is an archetypal fear. It's a literal fear. And it is, I think, a fear people have of the freedom of other people. Look at how they fear people coming to the United States that they'll take our freedom, there's too many. They'll take our freedom legislatively. They'll take it this way, they'll take it that way. They'll take our, they'll destroy the quality. The, the fear of freedom is absolutely something that has to be explored, which is so interesting because in this country, paradoxically, that's the promise. Mm -hmm. And it's something that this, this nation has feared so much in others. Mm -hmm. No, that's powerful. And I do think that that John addresses these things because yes. he's, um, what can I say? He, he really is, a, like, like most mystics, I think, he's a deep um, student of human nature. Mm -hmm. And I think he sees our, our weaknesses and this, this fear. And of course, many people will say that love is the opposite of fear. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that, that's found in John's epistle. And, and so forth that's found in our scriptures. But it's, it's also, I think, a lesson in psychology. I know that Buck Bostorce, a Lakota teacher, very important to me, he told me one day, fear in our tradition, as a Lakota practitioner, he said, for us, fear is a door in the heart that lets evil spirits in. So he said, all prayer is guarding your heart, strengthening your heart, so that fear stays on the outside of the door of the heart and doesn't come in. And notice, it's not just fear that comes in, but other evil spirits come with fear. The, yeah. the sadism that we see on television regarding um, this recent murder by, by five policemen and so forth, um, 
you know, the, the, the violence, you know, and all these other um, uh, dark energies that we're capable of um, attracting of and fostering ourselves. Yes. Exactly. Teresa yeah. called them reptiles. Yes, yes, she does. Which is interesting, given the reptile brain that we know about today. You know, very interesting right. that it's right. kind of the 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 first of our brains and the most ancient of our brains, but also and, and extremely important for our survival, but also uh, very dangerous if we allow it to run the show, <laughs> because it essentially has one one uh, value, and that is I win and you lose. That's you right. know, That's it's right. uh, like I say, it's. Uh, it, there's no compromise in 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 a wrestling with a with a crocodile. Uh, there's a winner and there's a loser. <laughs> but and this is where the mysteries come in that they're inviting us to the mammal brain, which yeah. is half as old as the reptilian brain, where there's love and there's kinship and there's forgiveness and there's laughter and there's caring for each other and compassion. And there's not afraid to love each other. There you go. Yeah, and and even to disagree. You know. But still, the love wraps the disagreement. The love is bigger than the, you know, than the, the strife. What do you say we describe the six classes and uh, leave them with that? Sure. Okay. That's what we want. <laughs> okay. First class. <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> We're going to treat the life of John the Cross because his life, even before he became a monk, <coughs> a friar, was extremely interesting and varied. And um, <clears throat> I don't want to go into a lot of the detail now, but his parents were very much in love. His father was an aristocrat, and his mother was a, a mixed blood. She was Moorish, and she was lived in the ghetto, literally. Her, she made a living by sewing. And he fell in love with her, and his family divorced him when he married her, his mother. His family, very rich aristocrats, would have nothing to do with him because he married, you know, out of his class, and he married a um, a person of mixed uh, blood and so forth. So that alone was interesting. That John, as a young child, uh, experienced real love between his parents, and then his father died when he was young, and so his very poor mother was left uh, a widow with three children, and. She went back to her in-laws and said, look, we're so poor. I got these three kids to take care of. Will you help me? No, they wouldn't help her. Didn't give her one penny. So she was a tough, strong woman. She raised these three kids, and each of them had phys physical and one had mental problems. They weren't easy kids. And um, so John witnessed strong womanhood. And I think that's one reason why he got along with Teresa of Avila so well, and she with him. Yeah, right. Yeah. And he was a feminist, and he went to a Jesuit high school, but he was not attracted by the Jesuits. The Jesuits were very masculine. They were soldier-like. Ignatius was a soldier. Right. But the Carmelites had much more of this feminine dimension. Of course, there were women Carmelites like Teresa of Avila, and they were more contemplative, and that's what drew him. So I just think the whole, his whole autobiography is very important to understand his he was a feminist in a in a time of great remember spain was the number one empire of the day in, in his time and they were going over raping the cultures in america which we know well and so um uh, he was fighting a pretty big uh, battle in yeah. his lifetime say nothing of the inquisition which is very alive and very active in spain in his time so um that's part of his his life that we want to go into. And um, then we want to go into creation spirituality in the four paths. And why? Because if you read the literature on John the Cross, it's really interesting. The poets who've translated him over the years and fall in love with his poetry, they almost all of them say his commentaries, because he wrote big commentary in, in his later years, they detract from the poetry. <laughs> they don't add anything is what they actually say. I think his comment, and the, yet his commentaries have been for most theologians the way to interpret John the Cross. But no, I think that he, he had two problems there. One is he was in a straitjacket theologically because the only way to interpret mysticism in his day, and he went to seminary, of course, was through the three paths of purgation, illumination, and union. And he distorts his entire poetry trying to put it into that box. It's a 
it's a it's round he's trying to put it in a square place it doesn't work and poets know that they'll say things don't read his commentaries read his poetry that's what we're going to do in our class but the four paths they speak profoundly to everything john is about if he had had the four paths his commentary would have been very different However, he probably would have been locked up by the Inquisition, too. So I think part of his own commentary is to keep the Inquisition off his track by following their, their theology of the purgation illumination. Yeah, that's what Teresa had to do. That's what they had to do to survive. Exactly. And remember, this was the same time that Luther and Calvin and others were, were arousing all of the rest of Europe. And so there was this conflict in the air between Catholicism and these other brand new movements that we now know as Protestantism. So uh, it was a very dynamic century that he lived through. And um, But my point is that we will approach John the Cross through the four paths of creative spirituality. And I think that we give him a much more thorough um, ground on which to stand that way because he's writing love poetry. His first major poem he wrote in prison called the, the Canticle, the Song of Songs. It was a an echo of the Song of Songs in the Bi Hebrew Bible. And it's essentially about a lover who's um, missing her beloved. And and it's it's all about love and yearning and, and all that energy that we put into yearning. But it's so beautiful. And there's this one passage that says, my beloved is the mountains. My beloved is the river. My beloved is the sound of silence and so forth. So it's pure creation spirituality. It's the via positiva. Mm -hmm. You don't get that in those other three paths. They don't talk about the view, but they talk about purgation. And the interpreters of John talk about purgation. But John, when he was leading novices in the order, he would put them out for an hour a day into nature on their own. And so there's a goat. And talk to nature. Let nature talk to you. Well, I'm going to jump in here. Yeah, I'm going to jump in here because purgation is um, perhaps an unfamiliar word. But if I were to, which is, the, you know, the kind of the burning from one's, the cleansing of one's darkness. But you know what I think? I think that's an archetypal dynamic that people engage in, and we call it self-loathing. Ooh. Mm. So we'll explore that in this yeah. class yeah. because that's what I think it is. And I think what okay. the creation, the four paths yeah. are the higher journey, mm -hmm. which is where this, the understanding love comes in. Exactly. Understanding love. Exactly. And being in love, not just right. with another two-legged one, but right. with life and all its dimensions, all its Letting beauty. Letting love. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And um, yeah, so we've already moved to the second class because the second class is going right. to be about uh, John's poem of the Canticle, which was prison literature. He wrote that in prison. Right. And um, it shows when you're in a tight spot, you do have to remember the beauty of life. You have to remember, why am I suffering this? Why am I going through this? You know, mm -hmm. uh, And so it takes you down deep to your primary values. What do you really cherish? What are you really in love with? Right. And um, and so there's a purification that goes on there, but it's not a purification that you create on yourself, you know, your, your prison circumstance uh -huh. essentially um, cleanses you and and strips you down to your okay. to your true self and your deepest loves. So we'll deal with that in the second class. And then the, the third and fourth class we'll deal with the combination of the via negativa, and that is the suffering, that is the dark night. And as you pointed out, not just dark night of soul, but dark night of society, and what I call the dark night of our species today, that yeah. we're in this place where we're not sure how, how it's going to end, and if we're going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And this is where John was in his, um, in his prison, and then when he escaped prison, that's when he wrote the dark, the poem of the dark night. And it's in that poem that the phrase, the fire inside comes through. And that's why we're calling this course, the fire inside, because it's a beautiful uh, line in his poem about how he had no guide, nothing else to, to live by, to give him the courage to escape, except the fire inside. 
So you want to explore that fire inside. And that is the Holy Spirit. That is the spark of the soul. That is our, our love, as you say, our capacity for love. And this got us to do brave things. And he did a very brave thing in escaping. It was it was a, a life and death uh, decision, really, because if he had if he had been caught escaping, which is very likely, um, he um, they would have killed him. And then um, and then you're going to help with the, especially in a special way with one of those uh, days on the Via Negativa, because clearly you, with all your healing experience and so forth have a lot to say about translating John's dark night of the soul to our uh, healing needs today. So I'm eager to, to interact with you about that and learn from you. And then the fifth class will be on the via creativa, creativity. And I call it how poetry saved the life of John the cross. That the, the, the prophets, the psychologists around you and Ornstein in the 1970s wrote a book on meditation and they said, that extrovert meditation, which is arches meditation, is the way of the prophets. And that um, all the prophets are poets. And, um, and John was a poet and he was a prophet because he was interfering with the dynamics of his culture in religion and society, just like Teresa of Avila was. That's how he got in trouble after all. And that's how she got in trouble. And both of them, as you say, uh, you know, did not succumb mm -hmm. and they didn't succumb to despair and they didn't succumb to surrender either they they kept up their their struggle for justice and for healing and for truth uh throughout their lives and but poetry was so important to john that he, he knew in fact you know he edited his poems when when he was out of prison and all i mean he fine-tuned them he he knew that this was a way to communicate his deepest loves and values to others and um he also um was a a painter and, a, and a, he sketched things like he sketched a picture of the crucifixion that was very unique it's from the top down and salvador dali copied it in his famous a painting of crucifixion he got it directly from john of the cross so john of the cross was a an, an artist in many many ways mm -hmm. and the Via Creativa is that kind of thing that many people heal through journaling, through singing, through music, through writing plays, you know, through through comedy. You know, so many so many of our comedians, you know, have <coughs> rough, rough times. Um, and, and, you know, a very high percentage of our comedians are black or Jewish. And I think it's because both both cultures have faced very uh, severe dark nights. Right. As, as a people. So they have something to say, which includes being able to laugh at the human condition, you know, and get us to laugh. Mm -hmm. And there's great healing and all of that, isn't there? The yep. love vocation of the comedian. And then our final class, number six, will be on the Via Transformativa. In other words, um, in what ways was John a prophet and a spiritual warrior and a sacred activist? And what is he saying to, to us today mm -hmm. about becoming uh, that way ourselves and how do we choose that kind of uh, spirituality and live it out but also we can look at the failures of john um you know no one what can i say he didn't defeat anyone in his lifetime <laughs> a lot of the mistakes of religion of his day are still going on today for example and uh but he tried and um he has this new dimension of the masculine. I think he's a, he could be a real leader to men to understand what healthy masculinity is. Uh, and he was a warrior uh, for good. He was a warrior for justice and for truth and for a deep spirituality and not for, uh, if you will, religious and political um, marriages, shotgun weddings. <laughs> he incorporated the divine feminine and the sacred masculine. And that is so needed today, that balance, I think, of the uh, masculine and the feminine. And I think he lived it, he walked it, he prayed it, he put it in his poetry. And, and of course, even his friendship with Teresa of Avila is a fine example of that too. That um, you know, one of one contemporary of Teresa of Avila said, she's, she's like a man, except she doesn't have a beard. 
<laughs> so that tells us something about her masculine side. Yeah. And I think there's a the contemplative dimension that John carries is is a feminine dimension um, that uh, that he integrated into his masculinity as well. So I think he's a fine model for a lot of uh, men today. I, I think there's so much here, and, and there's a couple of points I want to end on as I bring this to a close. And that's that we sometimes think that because people lived many years ago, that their relevance is not as important today as it was then. But in fact, the writings of great mystics, their wisdom is timeless. And, and what makes that so is that in through their challenges, they somehow accessed a level of truth that has no time to it. Mm. And it's like the vertical consciousness or mystical consciousness. They're in the realm of universal truth that will always be relevant to the human experience. Because if you took the, the clothing off and you took everything else off, the challenges of their day are the challenges of our day. Mm. That said, his his leaning on activism, Teresa was an activist. John was an activist. And I think I we'll leave it with this, which is activism is a path of healing as well as a path of social change. That if there's one thing that, a per, that will cause a person to spiral into depression, it's the feeling that there's nothing they can do to change their condition. And whether that activism is in their personal life or in a public life or in their family, activism means I have to make choices that change my circumstance. Mm -hmm. So your class, this wonderful class, The Fire Within Everybody, begins February 7th, goes to the 23rd, and it will be every Tuesday and Thursday for three weeks. And I think it's going to be exceptional. So off we go into another class. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. And I love your points you just made about the relevance of the wisdom that the mystics um, uncover and help name for us. That's right. And, yeah. Thank you, Matthew. We'll see you next week for class one. And thank you, everybody. Come join us. Thank you. <laughs>